H. B. Lovecraft, The Horror at Red Hook, Part 6. That same June evening, without having heard a word from the sea, Malone was desperately busy among the alleys of Red Hook. A sudden stir seemed to permeate the place, and as if appraised by grapevine telegraph of something singular, the denizens clustered expectantly around the dance hall church and the houses in Parker Place. Three children had just disappeared, blue-eyed Norwegians from the streets toward Goannas, and there were rumors of a mob forming among the sturdy Vikings of that section. Malone had for weeks been urging his colleagues to attempt a general cleanup, and at last, moved by conditions more obvious to their common sense than the conjectures of a Dublin dreamer, they had agreed upon a final stroke. The unrest and menace of this evening had been the deciding factor, and just about midnight, a raiding party recruited from three stations descended upon Parker Place and its environs. Doors were battered in, stragglers arrested, and candle-litted rooms forced to disgorge unbelievable throngs of mixed foreigners in figured robes, meters, and other inexplicable devices. Much was lost in the melee, for objects were thrown hastily down unexpected shafts, and betraying odors deadened by the sudden kindling of pungent incense. But splattered blood was everywhere, and Malone shuddered whenever he saw a brazier or altar from which the smoke was still rising. He wanted to be in several places at once, and decided on Salem's basement flat only after a messenger had reported the complete emptiness of the debilitated dance hall church. The flat, he thought, must hold some clue to a cult of which the occult scholar had so obviously become the center and leader. And it was with real expectancy that he ransacked those musty rooms, noted their vaguely charnel odor, and examined the curious books, instruments, ingots, and glass-stoppered bottles scattered carelessly here and there. Once a lean black-and-white cat edged between his feet and tripped him, overturning at the same time a beaker half full of red liquid. The shock was severe, and to this day Malone is not certain of what he saw, but in dreams he still pictures that cat, as it scuttled away with certain monstrous alterations and peculiarities. Then came the locked cellar door, and the search for something to break it down. A heavy stool stood near, and its tough seat was more than enough for those antique panels. A crack formed and enlarged, and the whole door did give way, but from the other side poured a howling tumult of ice-cold wind with all the stenches of a bottomless pit, and whence reached a sucking force, not of earth or of heaven, which, coiling sensibly about the paralyzed detective, dragged him through the aperture and down the unmeasured spaces, filled with whispers and wails and gusts of mocking laughter. Of course, it must have been a dream, all the specialists told him so, and he was nothing to prove the contrary. Indeed, he would rather have it thus. For them, the sight of old brick slums and dark foreign faces would not eat so deeply into his soul. But at the time, it was all horribly real, and nothing can ever efface the memory of those knighted crypts, those titan arcades, those half-formed shapes of hell that strode gigantically in silence, holding half-eaten things whose still surviving portions screamed for mercy or laughed with madness. Odors of incense and corruption joined in sickening concert, and the black air was alive with the cloudy, semi-visible bulk of shapeless elemental things with eyes. Something dark, sticky water was lapping at those onyx piers, 
And once the shivery tinkle of raucous little bells peeled over to greet the insane titter of a naked phosphorescent thing which swam into sight, scrambled ashore, and climbed up to squat leeringly upon a carved golden pedestal in the background. Avenues of limitless night seemed to radiate in every direction, till one might fancy that here lay the root of a contingent destined to sicken and swallow cities, engulf nations in the fetter of hybrid pestilence. Here cosmic sin had entered, and engulf nations in the fetter of hybrid pestilence. Unhallowed rites had commenced the grinning march of death that was to rot us all to fungus abnormalities too hideous for the grave to hold. Satan here held his Babylonish court, and in the blood of stainless children the leprous limbs of phosphorescent Lilith were laved. Incubi, succubi, all howled praise to Hecate, and headless moon calves bleated to the magna mater. Goats leaped to the sound of the thin, accursed flutes, and the gipans chased endlessly after misshapen fawns over rocks twisted like swollen toads. Moloch and Ashtaroth were not absent, for in this quintessence of old damnation the bonds of consciousness were laid down, and man's fancy lay open to visits of every realm of horror and every forbidden dimension that evil had powers to mould. The world and nature were helpless against such assaults from an unsealed well of night, nor could any sign or prayer check the whooprigous rot of horror which had come when a sage with the hateful key had stumbled upon a horde with a lock and brimming coffer of transmitted demon lore. Suddenly a ray of physical light shot through the phantasms, and Malone heard the sound of oars and missed the blasphemous things that should be dead. A boat with a lantern in its prow slowly darted into sight, made fast to an iron ring in the slimy stone pier and vomited forth several dark men bearing a long burden swathed in bedding. They take it to the naked phosphorescent thing upon the carved golden pedestal. The thing tittered and pawed at the bedding. Then they unswathed it, and propped upright before the pedestal the gangrenous corpse of a corpulent old man with stubbly beard and unkempt white hair. The phosphorescent thing tittered again, and the men produced bottles from their pockets and anointed its feet with red, whilst they afterward gave the bottles to the thing to drink from. All at once from an arcaded avenue leading endlessly away, there came the demonic rattle and wheeze of a blasphemous organ. Choking and rumbling out the mockeries of hell in a cracked, sardonic hiss. In an instant, every moving entity was electrified and forming at once into a ceremonial procession. The nightmare horde slithered away in guess in quest of that sound. Goat, satyr, Aegeopan, incubus, succubi, lemur, twisted toad, and shapeless elemental dog-faced howler and silent stutterer within the darkness, all led by the abominable naked phosphorescent thing that had squatted upon the carved golden throne, and that now strode insolently, hearing in its arms the glassy-eyed corpse of that corpulent old man. The strange dark men danced in the rear, and the whole column skipped and leaped, while Dionysic fury. Malone staggered after them a few steps, delirious, hazy, doubtful of his place in this or any other world. Then he turned, 
faltered, and sank down upon the cold, damp stone, gasping and shivering as the demon organ croaked on, and the howling and drumming and wrinkling of the mad procession slowly grew fainter and fainter. Vaguely he was conscious of chanted horrors and shocking croakings far afar. Now and then a wail or whine of ceremonial devotion which floated to him through the black arcade, whilst eventually there rose the dreadful Greek incantation whose text he had read above the pulpit of the dance hall church. O friend, companion of night, thou who rejoice in the baying of dogs, here a hideous howl burst forth, and spilt blood, here nameless sounds filed with the morbid shriekings, who wandereth in the midst of shades among the tombs, here whistling sighs occurred, who longs for blood and brings terror to mortals, short, sharp cries from the myriad of throats. Gorgo repeated, more, more, repeated with ecstasy, thousand-faced moons, sighs and flutes, look favorably upon our sacrifices. As the chant closed, a general shout went up, hissing sounds nearly drowned the croaking of the cracked brass organ. Then a gasp, as from the many throats, and a babble of barked and bleated words, Lilith, great Lilith, behold the bridegroom. More cries, a clamor of rioting, and the sharp clicking footfalls of a running figure. The footfalls approached, and Malone raised himself to his elbows to look. The luminosity of the crypt diminished, had now increased once more, and in that devil light there appeared the fleeing form of that which should not flee, or feel, or even breathe. The glassy-eyed, gangrenous corpse of the corpulent old man, now needing no support, but animated by some infernal sorcery of the rite just closed. After it raced the naked, tittering, phosphorescent thing that belonged to the cavern pedestal, and still further beyond painted the dark men and all the dreaded crew of sentient loathsomeness. The corpse was gaining on its pursuers, and seemed bent on a definitive object, straining with every rotting muscle toward the carved golden pedestal, whose necromantic importance was evidently so great. Another moment, and it had reached its goal, whilst the trailing throng labored on with more frantic speed. But they were too late, for in one final spurt of strength which ripped tendon from tendon and sent its noisome bulk floundering to the floor in a state of jelly dissolution, the staring corpse which had been Robert Saddam, achieved its object in its triumph. The push had been tremendous, but the force had held out, and as the pusher collapsed to a muddy blotch of corruption, the pedestal he had pushed, torrented, tipped, and finally careened from its onyx base into the thick waters below, sending up a parting gleam of carven gold as it sank heavily to undreamable gulfs of the lower Tartarus. In that instant, too, the whole scene of horror faded to nothingness before Malone's eyes, and he fainted amidst the thunderous crash which seemed to blot out all in that evil universe.